And good evening, everybody on the East Coast. Good afternoon to the West Coast and good afternoon slash evening to anybody in the middle. Uh, my name is Michael Filigera. I am with LogicalSignals.com, which is my, uh, my own LLC. And what I'm going to be presenting today is a little bit different, hopefully, than what others are doing. And the title of the presentation, which actually unfortunately didn't make it to the, uh, the sheets, was that seeing or nature's law as it is applied by Eliot and Fibonacci. And a little background on myself. I uh, studied Eliot back in 1988, and I studied with Robert Prechter and Dan Ascani. And I was fascinated by the concept. And so I immediately started to apply uh, my learning and kept an hourly chart. At the time, I was uh, living in Amsterdam and I was trading the European Options Exchange on the European Options Exchange, and I was trading the index, the EOE index. And so back then, we didn't have all this electronic, wonderful where charts were produced and everything was all there for you. And so every hour I would take out a trading card and I would write down the price. And that afternoon I would go uh, back to my house and I would make a chart. And I guess my graph paper was about a 27 inch screen. And so eventually, you know, you fill that up. And, and so to get a long term picture of the market, I would have to lay all my charts out across the floor in in my house and i found the value of elliot wave to be astounding and and quite uh accurate and so i've used it ever since i have published uh analysis elliot wave analysis uh internationally and i have covered the european markets that both the equity the interest rate i've covered commodities i covered the precious metals I've also covered US markets. And so I still trade and I may be more active now because I, I was originally an options market maker. And uh, once the floors started to disappear, get lighter and lighter, as everything moved over to electronic trading, I left the floors and I uh, came to my house and set myself up and continued to trade options until I realized that I really wasn't enjoying the volatility uh, in the manner of which I was able to trade it. And so I decided that I really was going to give a try at day trading. And so uh, that was about uh, 2011, 2012. And uh, so I started to uh, day trade and really found it to be amazing and basically started with the NASDAQ. That's why you're seeing the NASDAQ chart here today. The NASDAQ is wild, it's crazy, it's volatile, it's thin, it's thick, it's everything, all of the above, and constantly each and every day will hold a surprise for us. But to begin my presentation, I wanted to really start on a discussion about Elliott Wave and go back to R. N. Eliot's original works. And of course, everybody should understand that the Eliot wave is named after him, R. N. Eliot. He wrote the thesis, he, uh, did, he came up with the idea and he put everything together. And now I want to just kind of put a wrap around to how that all took place. So Eliot originally wrote a book called Nature's Law. So I'm going to be pulling a lot of things right out of Nature's Law uh, that he wrote. And he, inter he introduced the whole package as follows. He basically said that no truth meets more general acceptance than that the universe is ruled by law. And whether or without law, it is self-evident that there would be chaos. And where chaos is, nothing is. Navigation, chemistry, aeronautics, architecture, all of it works in dealing with things animate and things inanimate under law because nature itself works in this way. 
since the very character of the law is order or constancy, it follows that all that happens will repeat and can be predicted if we know the law. Very, very true statement. So as human beings, we tend to think that we're not a part of nature, but in fact, we are. And so going on, that just even though we may not understand the cause or the underlying of what the cause is of a particular move, we can, by observation, predict that particular move, and we can predict its reoccurrence. And by that, he went on to describe the sun. The sun was expected to recurrently rise at a fixed time thousands of years before people really realized what, what that was all about. Um, so going to man or humans, humans are no less a natural object than the sun or the moon. And our actions, too, in their metrical occurrence, are subject to analysis. This is a very important fact, that when I learned this, I was like, wow, okay, so now I understand why Elliot works. So this is an important little tidbit. Human activities, while amazing in character, if approached from the rhythmical bias, contain a precise and natural answer to some of the world's most perplexing problems. Furthermore, because humans are subject to rhythmical procedure, calculations having to do with our activities can be projected far into the future with the justification and uncertainty that before was unattainable. I was fascinated after reading this. I was thinking to myself, wow, how does this guy put this all together? And what he did is that he started to chart and realize that the moves themselves were human emotionally based. And so he started to put together how we can recognize these. And therefore, there came the, the Elliott Wave principle or all of how we label things and why Elliott Wave is basically a theory that is on building blocks. So we have to understand that when we, and I will talk about the basic premise of Elliot is that the market moves in, in five waves in either up or down, followed by three waves. And that produces a complete movement. And that complete movement is usually then the first and second wave of one degree higher. So they just build and build and build until you reach a level of height that eventually just keeps on going. But Elliot came up with that there are great, his uh, breakdown was grand super cycle, super cycle. And this would be a super cycle here. I do not count up to a grand super cycle because a, I don't think I'll be alive to ever see its conclusion, uh, but others do. So this is super cycle, cycle, primary, intermediate, minor, and then all the way over here, you can see this color is minute. So we can get down pretty small. And when you start to understand Elliot, and you can break down these particular impulse moves and corrective moves, then you're gonna know what's inside. Now, what he also then added and through study was the mathematical applications that come together and meet as we produce these waves and corrections. And what he studied then, this is all really based on the study that he went to Egypt and he really did a study on the, um, the pyramids, the pyramids of Giza. And if you've never been to the, the pyramids, um, and you get the chance, please don't let it go by. Go and see this, these wonders of the world, because they truly are. And they're mammoth, and they're over 5,000 years old. And you get to sit there and think about how in God's name did they come up and put this together. It's actually all done by the summation index, which is Fibonacci's work. Now, it was all completed prior to Fibonacci ever being born. Fibonacci was a real person. He was a mathematician from Italy. 
And he lived in the 13th century. So after he visited Egypt and Greece, and he returned to Italy, he disclosed what is now known as the summation series. So the series of numbers is as follows. One, two, three, five, eight, 13, 21, 34, 55, 89, 144, et cetera. And it just keeps going. So he also said that any two adjoining numbers equal to the next higher number, for example, five plus eight equals 13. Any number divided by the next higher number gives a ratio of 0.618. These are important little uh, uh, numbers to keep an eye on and remember. So for example, eight divided by 13 is 0.618. So any number divided by the next lower number gives a reciprocal of 1.618. So in the lower numbers, the ratios are not exact, but close enough for practical purposes. So to simplify this whole thing, that we kind of take 0.618 and round it up to 62, or the inverse 1.62. So things, you can do that, but you still, to be more accurate, you, you try to use the regular number. So of note that the first five numbers of the summation series, one, two, three, five, and eight, are also, if you take a look at a pyramid, they're shown in the complete diagram of a pyramid. So what I'm trying to just bring out is how that as we progress and you continue to study, you're going to start to find out that within nature, within nature, which we as human beings are a part of, all of this comes into play. We are a part of nature. And therefore, as being a part of nature, we do follow the laws. We are subject to the laws of nature. There's no way we can get around it. So the numbers that I just talked about, and they're called in that summation series, because they represent a sum of the preceding numbers of the series. So the, if the series is of numbers is 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21, 34, 55, 89, 144, et cetera, each member of this series is obtained by adding together the two preceding numbers. So if we take any two members of the series and divide one into the other, say 34 into 55, we get a ratio. And that ratio is constant throughout the entire summation series. So the ratio of 1.618 plus a number with a never ending fraction. So what we're saying is that we cut it off and to get 1.618 because as the numbers increase, so does that ratio, so does that fraction. So if we reverse the operation and divide 55 into 34, then we get that 0.618 or 62. So it is an extraordinary coincidence that the ratio of 1.618 or 0.618 is a ratio which fascinated the ancient Greeks and it was extraordinary because they could have had no suspicion of what the connection of or with architecture of plants. Now, you may have heard this if you've studied, you may have heard this before on how we have the conch shell. That's a Fibonacci spiral. We have how so many different things are all broken down into Fibonacci sequence. So, so from experience, I have learned that 144 is the highest number of practical value. And what I mean by that is in a complete cycle within any market. So a complete stock market cycle or a market cycle, the number of minor waves is going to be 144. So in other words, it's like we have in a bull market, five waves. Bear market, three waves. The total or the complete cycle, eight waves. If we break that now, we come down and we go into an intermediate degree, the, and it'll turn itself into 21, 13, and 34. 21 in the bull market, 13 in the bear market, and 34 as a complete. So all of these numbers are Fibonacci numbers, and the entire series is employed 
in its entirety. So the length of the waves may vary, but not the numbers. So now we can take a look at ourselves. Our own bodies follow the numbers three and five. So from our torso, there are five projections, a head, two arms, two legs. Each leg and arm is subdivided into three sections. Legs and arms terminate in five toes or five fingers. The toes and fingers, except for the big toe, are subdivided into three sections. We have five senses. So what I oh, forgot to add in the very beginning, my study, my uh, university study was in music. And what I didn't realize is that Fibonacci is in music as well. And so the best example was, and, and I also was a, a pianist, I studied piano. And so we have the basic example on a piano keyboard, an octave, which means eight. So each octave is composed of eight white keys and five black keys, another Fibonacci number, 13. Intentional? I don't think so. I think it's the law of nature. So when we take a look at these things and we put them in to human activity. So this is how uh, Eliot kind of put together his thesis that all of the movement within the markets is based on human activity, right? So human activity could be the prices of equities, the prices of bonds, uh, patents, price of gold, the population, movements of citizens from cities to farms or vice versa. This is human activity. So when we kind of keep putting that all together, we realize that there are going to be distinctive features of human activities. And they basically fall into different buckets when you're talking about a market, but they are still very, very important. And when we can understand them, then we can start to move around and realize that these patterns repeat themselves constantly, all day long, all year long, all decade long. The patterns repeat themselves. So once we learn what those patterns are and how they come about and what produces the different degrees, then of course, you're onto something that can turn into a very valuable tool for you to use when you're trying to analyze or figure out trade entries. So we can take this from a monthly maximum chart. I'll just kind of throw that up there just to show. You're not gonna see because it all gets grouped together, but you can see this is of the NASDAQ. The NASDAQ goes back on this chart, or this is also through Think or Swim. It uh, goes back to 1999. I know the NASDAQ actually, that is in the NQ. I can go back on the cash market. Oops. And the cash market actually goes back to when it started, which was, no, this goes back to 85. I think it was right around there when the NASDAQ became an exchange. And so therefore they started listing stocks. And so, but you can see this incredible, incredible off of the lows in 2002, what the NASDAQ did. It was incredible. And there are a lot of reasons that it did it, what it did and how it did it. And this actually, let me just kind of open this up so you can see. This is the uh, pandemic low. This is March of 2020. 6,771 is that low right there. That high is 16,768. It's amazing. And there was particular reasons why the market did that. And this is all very tradable, very countable. And you can just tally it up and forecast <clears throat> because basically above, uh, oh, I have to go back. Anything above the market had reached 4,800 back in 19 or just after the turn of the millennium, like 48. 16. 
So anything above that from here, we were into uncharted territory. I want to say that the, one of the benefits of Fibonacci and Elliott combined is that it gives you the ability to forecast out, particularly when you're moving into unchartered water, unchartered territory. Market's never been here. How high can it go? You can use combinations of Fibonacci, extensions and retracements, and you can plot out a path that the market's going to take. There are relationships now. So let me just go dive right into Elliot. And if you have experience in Elliot, then I'm going to be repeating things that you likely already know. I apologize ahead of time, but I just got to lay down some basics here that within Elliot Wave, like I just described to begin with, that the market produces impulse waves, corrective waves. And, and this is what Elliot had found. An impulse waves consists of five, is counted as follows, one, two, three, four, five. Waves one, three, and five are the actual impulse. Wave two corrects wave one, wave four corrects wave three. So with that premise that once we complete the five waves, then the market will do what we commonly call a correction. And, it, and the labeling on a correction is letters. So it's A, B, C. Now, if you've got that basic pattern, you get five waves up, you do three waves down, then you get another five waves up, you do three waves down, then you get another five waves up, that completes the cycle. That completes, that's a complete movement. So as we stair step, stair step up in terms of we're building, so we're in a bull market, let's say, you're going to have five waves up, three waves down, five waves up, three waves down, five waves up. And then that finishes your next level up. So again, what how I'm going to describe this for you is the yellow is an intermediate degree. So again, remember what I started with. I started with a uh, minute degree, then a minor degree. Minor degree are here in the uh, saddle brown or the orange colored. Then the intermediate degree are the yellow. Next degree higher is the primary degree. Those are green. Next up is the cycle degree, that's in brick red, and then super cycle degree. Now to show you on timing, I can go back out and show you, and this time I will go over to the Dow, where I have the data on the Dow goes back to uh, 1902, February 1st of 1902. So this is a little bit more difficult because of that. So this is grand super cycle. That was 1929. This was the crash. Then in 1932, we began, actually it was right through, we began the super cycle degree rally. What's gonna be inside that rally? five waves of super cycle degree. What do we just complete here? You can't even see because it's going to not far enough. Uh, let me see if I can get that back. Nope, let me go back out, do that again, and come back over here to my max. And what we have all the way up there is super cycle wave three. So when did it start? I'm just gonna eyeball it, 1942. Some, some could say 1932, some could say 1942. And um, I, yes, I will jump to questions in just a moment because I don't wanna bypass them. And I wanna make sure that we can answer them as I go along. Um, okay, I shall. All right, let me just go back. That's a thank you, thank you. Oh my God, yes, David. Uh, you do remember graph paper? Yes, I. That's how I started. Um, the NQ is nuts. Order out of chaos. Yes. In fact, the title of my podcast, as you all know, is called "Eye of the Storm," and I chose it uh, because in the eye of the storm there is calm. As this hurricane or the storm is swirling around you, you can look up. 
and see sunshine. You can see a blue sky. Meanwhile, the front wall of the hurricane's already gone through. The back wall is coming. But if you stay in the eye, you're going to stay in calm. You're, you're out of the chaos. So, yes, that's exactly right. Um, I will provide my contact info. And as far as think or swim, I hand label all of this just using the drawing, um, the text tool. So I do it all by hand. And so, but any other, uh, Elliott Wave charting, again, I do it by hand. There are algorithms out there that supposedly can do it for you, um, but they're not accurate. You're not accurate. And you're right, the SPX does go back way further than the uh, NASDAQ. Um, quick question from Mark. Is it possible that algorithms can deviate from nature's law and not conform to Elliott wave theory? Um, uh, deviate from nature's law, no, because algorithms are written by human beings. So it's already written in. And do they all conform to Elliott wave theory? In the end, yes, but there have been my, what I've noticed over my years of using Elliott and now changing into uh, to, to trade, which basically is 100% quantitative trading right now. Everything is algorithmically produced. So it would be hard to say that it doesn't conform to Elliott wave, um, but there's certain things that kind of have expanded, shortened, uh, one thing being time time and what it would take to have a cycle roll out that has somehow tended to be shortened by a great deal and I'll, I'll go over that um, in a moment now so and yes that a third wave can never be the shortest the shortest of one three and five it does not have to, it's not, it is most often the longest and the strongest out of waves one, three, and five. But what it cannot be, so the rule is, what it cannot be, is it cannot be the shortest wave out of waves one, three, and five. And that protects you. So if I could just, I'm going to go over real quick and being able to look at Elliot as it functions and how we count it and that there are, and obviously, I think quite a few of you already are very, very aware um, <clears throat> that there are basically four or five rules and several more guidelines. But I've always tended to believe that the rules are there for a reason. And you don't break the rules. Because if you break the rules, then it no longer is Elliott Wave theory. He set the rules for a particular reason to keep us as the students, as the analyst, basically out of trouble. If we're trying to apply Elliott Wave theory or Elliott Wave principle to a market and we're coming up with a count that we're breaking rules, well, then you're not going to get the expected result. That has been my um, my my point or, or what. I have seen by others. Now, here is the uh, S&P real quick. And you're right, that one, uh, or the SPX, that one goes back to 1928. So the Dow's, the Dow's the winner. I get them all the way back to, to 1902. And this is, again, is think or swim, by the way. So I'm, I'm very pleased with think or swim in terms of how they can give me so much data. Now, again, going into how we count, so again, we start basically, again, I, we, the way I learned was because the way Elliot did it, and that was every hour taking the number of where the index was and then plotting that on a piece of graph paper and then connecting the dots. The dots eventually started to produce the moves. So now here we are. Let's start from, I'm gonna go, go to a more current chart. And I'm going to go back to the NASDAQ because that's my, my monster of choice. And I'm going to start, let's, let's start in a weekly chart and we can go here. So in, in January, I think it was actually November for the, uh, for the NASDAQ, 
for January for the S&P. So the, the NASDAQ hit an all-time high at 16,768 in November of 2021. So at that level, I had been counting up. So I'd gone back and I'd counted all the way in the NASDAQ as far as I could get and really had taken it from where the dot-com bust, the collapse, which actually was in, uh, it doesn't go backwards. Isn't that funny how that doesn't work? Let's try it this way. I'm gonna go back out to that weekly chart. Ah, it doesn't, let me go out to that monthly chart. This, actually I have to go to the maximum monthly. That's how much has taken place. This is the dot-com bust. The NASDAQ lost 87% of its value in approximately two years. I was um, out here on the Pacific Exchange. And so I was there. And I was a market maker on the floor. And we had a lot of uh, NASDAQ stocks, a lot of tech stocks. Why? Because tech, I live in San Francisco, which is where the Pacific Exchange is. Silicon Valley is just down, down the road, so to speak. And so we picked up a lot. We had Microsoft Compact, um, JD Uniphase, all of these different um, Compact Computer, which got bought out, all these different companies. And so when that dot-com bust happened, it produced a cycle degree move. So from that low in November, excuse me, September of two, 2002, the NASDAQ launched on a cycle fifth wave. So this is how I went back. I went back and I had to really put all of my counts in, all of the counting, every single wave. Now, here we are in a cycle degree, wave five. That's what we did from 2002 to 2021. What is inside of that? Remember, building blocks. So what's inside? Five waves of primary degree. Right, So that's inside the cycle fifth wave, five waves of primary degree. What's going to be in primary wave one? Five waves of intermediate degree. What's going to be in primary wave two? Three waves, labeled ABC, of intermediate degree. Now, I can break this down even further, right? Because here I go into what happened there. That was intermediate wave three. So here we are again. What's inside this intermediate wave one? five waves of minor degree. Here it is more evident within the third wave, one, two, three, four, five. And again, I can break it down. What's gonna be inside minor two? Three waves of minute degree labeled ABC. What's gonna be in minor wave four? Three waves of minute degree labeled ABC. So the pattern repeats, the pattern repeats, the pattern repeats, and that, is important. Um, yes, the Dow does do. And so, yes, 2002 to 2022. Um, now, so if you can, you have to remember the basic premise that what is inside these larger degree moves well, we have a primary degree, then we have an intermediate degree, then we have a minor degree. So if we start bottom up instead of top down, we have minor, we have minute degree. We do five waves up in a minute degree, we do an ABC of minute degree, that's going to complete on a minor degree of waves one and two. So that continues to play out as we go up the scale. So primary one, ABC of intermediate degree, down primary two, where now we, well, in other words, it's like this was a one, two, three, four, five, and this was an ABC all in intermediate degree. It turns into primary one and two. And if we continue to go up, you're going to see that the process does continue to, to do just that. I could go backwards to figure out on what, what we would see in cycle wave three 
again, five waves of primary degree and breaking it down all the way down. So eat, they repeat, they repeat, they repeat. And somebody already said that repeat, 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 or wash, rinse, repeat. You can use whichever analogy you want to plug in there, but it's true and it works. So here we are. We've come all the way through. I counted, and you, and then also understand that within Elliot, as you learn Elliot, not only is the third wave most often the longest and the strongest wave, it's going to be because waves one, three, and five are going to subdivide into their own five wave structures. We know this. No matter what degree we're on, it breaks down into its own five. Except in the third wave, this third within it subdivides. So we hit an extended wave, except in this particular case, we have an extended third and an extended fifth. And so, and that is something else that I realized as we moved into more algorithmic trading. We, when in Elliot, when he wrote the, the thesis, when he wrote his principle, he basically was saying that out of one, three, and five, one of them will extend, will subdivide in and of itself. And that normally happens within that third wave. So if you ever, if any of you follow my work, you will, you will notice that. I am constantly um, talking about a three of a three of a three, a third of a third or a three of a three, the type of mood that happens. And that happens when that third wave starts and I don't use an indicator. I'll be with that question in just a moment. I, I um, The question is, is what indicators do I use to determine the end of wave one and the beginning of a wave three? of the same degree. Um, within it, it, within wave one, it will consist of five waves. And when I can count up five waves, then I realize that's done and now I'm gonna correct. And when the structure, the structure is also important. You will notice structure, corrective are ABC. They're not fives. So some of the rules are, in Elliot, is that impulse waves are labeled one, two, three, four, five. Wave two corrects wave one, wave four corrects wave three. Wave two will be a three wave structure. So we, we can divide things up by, it's not difficult to go pick out five waves. What becomes more difficult is the corrections. And have we ever noticed something by the way, how a market will, fly higher and then take forever to correct. Corrections can last weeks and months, but it didn't take us weeks and months to get up there. Right, on the degree that we're talking, yes, it did, it took years. But in terms of internally, as we're watching this thing, like for example, this fourth wave, that was pretty quick. It was three weeks, start to finish, three weeks. COVID, March of 2020, started in February, really kicked in and stopped, finished by uh, March. So, yes, markets correct faster than upside. Um, I don't think so. They can, if we're crashing, yes, we're going we're gonna to correct much bigger. But back to that question, end of wave one in the beginning of a third wave, while well, in between is going to be a second wave. So you got wave two and then you got wave three. So that would be that, but how was COVID not an anomaly? I suppose that's a really good question because I, I wouldn't, cons yeah. COVID itself was not necessarily the anomaly. What happened because of COVID is what really produced this, the decline that we had. And that was being being shuttered, being closed up, being told you can't go out, you can't go to work, you can't go to the grocery store because they had to put some control around trying to stop how quickly this was spreading without really knowing much about it other than you got it and you more than likely died. 
So I don't think COVID itself was an anomaly. I think what happened after may have been considered an anomaly, but it was an immediate reaction by the markets to the unknown. We didn't know. All we knew is that the globe was shutting down. People were told to stay home. China locked down, locked down. So therefore, what's the first thing that's going to happen? Commerce stops. Yeah, I can go with that. The COVID was an event-led crisis, whereas 2008 was a structural crisis financially. That's true. Once event passes, the correction rectifies faster. Well, yes and no. The reason that the, that we rectified so quickly is because the government, the Federal Reserve, the Treasury had to print trillions of dollars. Otherwise, we would have all went bankrupt. If we were unable to leave our homes, to go out to our jobs, and to earn our salary, and all you need to do is go ask the people that could not work from home. Their job required them to be out of the house. So they lost their jobs. So they needed to have a means to which they were going to be able to put food on the table, so you know, take care of their families, et cetera, et cetera, pay their bills. That's what propelled this particular move that took us all the way up to the all-time highs. Now, what I kind of want to, and my time goes by very, very quickly, is to kind of just look at when we are talking about how long it took to get up to this high and what it completed, that we once we got up here and I then had completed all of my counting, and trust me, when here, I'm, pro I'm projecting. Realizing, okay, that was primary three, primary four, which at the time I didn't. So it took me a little bit of time to get that up there. But I just followed my count, realizing I had completed five, three, four. That was quick. I didn't think it was over. The market let me know it was. And how did I know it was? That was three waves down. And I didn't know if it was going to be wave A with a B wave and then another C wave that would bring us all the way down to here. But obviously, ABC down, wave four. And again, these were massive declines. There's a massive decline in the NASDAQ. 9740 down to 66, 75, I think it was, 28. 6629 from 97. That's like two thirds. That's a lot. It's another 87%. This was 89. This was 87. They look miles different. This was primary. This was cycle. Still very damaging. So the takeoff from here was um, fueled by the government injecting trillions of dollars into the economy, into the system. And what our little corrections within it we're usually, I think, politically related, et cetera, and so, but there was a lot of stuff going on. But in any case, what I wanted to bring out is that by using Fibonacci, Fibonacci extensions, which by the way, so the person that was asking, Fibonacci extensions are right here on Thinkorswim. Most, most uh, charting platforms have both retracements and the extensions. Extensions are extremely important when you're moving forward or in either in either in either direction, whether you're moving up or you're coming off, there are relationships. There are Fibonacci relationships between the waves. There are personalities of the waves. So once you study Elliot, you can really wrap yourself around it. You get yourself your rules down. You don't break your rules. All right. There, and you have your guidelines. And so now you can build a count. And you will realize very quickly whether your count is correct or it needs to have adjustment. Um, I just, I have a lot of experience using Elliot and I use it every single day. 
and I follow it every single day and I check on it every single day on its progression. Now, I want to come all the way down. I want to bring it back to the daily because here we are in our corrective process. Now, if it literally took us on, a, on, a, on this particular degree, on the cycle degree, it took us 13 years, right? So actually, no, it took us 20 years because cycle wave four completed in 2002. This completed in 2021. So 19 years of rally. So we're correcting 19 years of rally. I can go back. This primary fifth wave, if we're going to correct on that level, that takes us back to the March of 2020 lows. On a, an intermediate degree, we're just going back to October. So basically, was a month. So that tells you degree and time. So here we are. We finish what I'm terming as a super cycle wave three. That super cycle wave began, I'm going to say, let me just tell, double check. The super cycle wave began in the 1981 or two. Might have even have been the 87 crash. Um, I'd have to go back and double check on that for you. But a while back. Um, can I speak to the Fibonacci spiral arc and time ratios extensions? Um, not necessarily because I think that that Fibonacci cycles are accurate, but sometimes need adjusting. And so I've never really followed through on, um, thank you, 80-ish to 87. Yes. I, I, I don't particularly use them. I think the market will generally, you can put together your cycles um, differently. And there are the people that, that use different techniques to come up with those cycles. And if you're really interested in some of that, I would go to the Foundation for the Study of Cycles. There's a gentleman in Germany and his algorithms now. So again, everything is, is algorithmically put together, but he, he's really got the cycles down to where we get to these very nice short-term cycles. Like this was a cycle low. This was a cycle high. Now we're working to the next cycle low. So if we're going here, and this was June, this was August, we can estimate that in June we had July, August. Actually, mid, it actually was two months. So this next cycle low, we would think would come in two months. So we have September, October. But a lot of people are calling for it. Um, his name, first name is Christian. But if you go to the Foundation for the Study of Cycles, um, I'll try to find it. I'm sorry to say it's not coming to my mind at the moment. Uh, but there are going to be short-term cycles, and he does them on the S&P. And he actually applies it to quite a few things. He, he's, it fascinated me because he was applying them. Um, they just did a symposium on precious metals. So gold, platinum, silver, et cetera, copper. And his cycle work blew me away. So I've been a member of the Foundation for the Study of Cycles for quite a while. They are important. They are good to kind of understand that they do occur. And we have cycle lows and we have cycle highs. Um, so again, if the whole cycle is going to be about three months and it took us two, then it should be one to get us all the way back down to that bottom. That's kind of part of the theory. Um, Wow, good question. Uh, um, so being asked is where exactly the primary green sea, which is now what's in force, is expected to go to. Um, that jumping right to the end right there, but I don't mind. So first of all, let's just kind of talk about some of the Fibonacci relationships within these waves. So again, 
we've gone from counting everything one, two, three, four, five. Now we're in a correction. Time-wise, this is the point that, I'm, that I want to make about how what could possibly, because of, of things becoming quantitative and everything's algorithmically driven, one of the things where I've seen that this is truly coming in is via cycle, how long it takes. Because if I go and just on a regular basis and say that this cycle degree was 19 years. So on a cycle degree, and if I go up one, I'm probably just going back 30 or 40 years. So normally what would we think that a, a cycle or a super cycle degree, fourth wave, yes, um, or F, FSC, Foundation for the Study of Cycles, FSC. I'm not sure if that's exactly the one. Um, <clears throat> if, but it is .org, by the way. So FSC.org, I think is the correct address. So if I'm trying to figure out how long should this uh, super cycle wave four take, well, if it took 30 years or 40 years to get to it, if even we just do a straight Fibonacci and do like 3A2 of that, well, then we're kind of looking at maybe like between 10 and 12 or 10 and 13 years. And then so way the way I'm breaking this thing down is that, again, I look at each level, right? We're, we're now we're working Instead of working down, which we do, we're working back up to that super cycle. Great. Thank you so much. It is cycles.org. Um, that each one of the moves, right? Because now we're gone from labeling in numbers, we're labeling in letters. And all of the degrees operate in the same fashion, in the same direction. So we're correcting. All of them will be labeled ABC. What could be different is that an A wave can be five or it can be three. But still, A, B, C completes the A, B intermediate degree cycle. So what does that do? We go one up. That completes primary wave A. Now we get another A, B, C. Now this one, I was not counting it as such until after we got the back down on my daily chart until we got this move the other uh, a week ago where we dropped 500 right off a high how was that beautiful that was much deeper than i thought because i originally had put this as minor a minor b minor c for intermediate wave a and we were in an intermediate b wave as a part of this primary b wave i know it takes a while to get used to the numbers and the letters. They can be very confusing. But understand that in a corrective phase, no matter what degree, it's labeled A, B, C. And then understanding within wave A and wave C, all C waves, all C waves, here's a rule, all C waves are five waves. They're always going to be labeled. A C wave will always be labeled one, two, three, four, five. Whereas in a wave can be labeled its own ABC, or it can be one, two, three, four, five. If it's a five, three, five, so in other words, A is five, C is five, that is then considered zigzag. So there, there's only one form of impulse wave. That's one, two, three, four, five. That's it. Impulse is five. Within the correction, we have two basic forms, basic structures. The first being zigzag, which is five for A, three for B, five for C, five, three, five. The other would be considered a flat. So uh, yes, yes. So here we had an ABC and then we were coming up in an ABC to form this primary B wave. What's gonna be inside that primary B wave? It is going to be an ABC of intermediate degree. But I had gone like, okay, what's going to be inside intermediate wave A? Either five waves or three waves. This was a three. This was a three. This was a five. So I kept it as intermediate wave A and count, started to count this. That tossed it. That huge down day tossed it. 
cost the count off. But I've held it, I have held it as a possibility that the market continues to work its way down. So therefore it stays here. It's my alternate, it's, it's view number two. I, I will present one or two views and some people call them preferred alternate. I call them view number one, view number two, because it just helps out a little bit cleaner. Um, because they both at the time and still, it's kind of breaking, but still carry the same probability of being the, the wave in force. And I'm going to have to wrap this up real quick here because now I'm realizing how far I've got. But I'll tell you what, I'm also presenting tomorrow. I present tomorrow at 1 p.m. Eastern. Come back. And I will continue this because. To answer the question of how far I think this C wave can go, if we're looking at the Fibonacci, straight Fibonacci, wave C would equal wave A at 8,041. What's got to be inside that C wave? Five waves down of intermediate degree. What's going to be in that first wave of intermediate degree? Five waves of minor degree. Um, my projection for the S&P, I'll give it to you in, in the ES, and I'll move over there. So, but C waves are often, most often, you know what? Yes, you're right. Thank you. It wasn't, but that is who it is, Lars. Yes, that is the person I was referring to from the cycles. Brilliant. The, I, I really like that short-term cycle study he, he has done. So intermediate degree, I also had to bump up because of the way the, it, the waves were breaking down. So right now, I think that wave C would be equal to wave A. Mm, that doesn't really fit because wave C, and particularly on a primary degree, are destructive. They're fast. They move quickly and they move far. So what is the relationship? The relationship, it could be 100%. The relationship could be 1.618. So actually, my my first thought was that the primary degree sequence should finish back down towards the fourth wave of one lesser degree, which is right there at 6648. Because what's it going to be completing? It's going to be completing wave A on a cycle degree. So that one is there. I'm going to go one more question, and then I'm going to have to turn it over because you don't want to miss the next person coming. Um, Sonny Harris is up next after me, and Sonny and I love her work. I love her work. It's very important, and she's a mathematician, and she knows how to, to write code. And so what she's going to present is, I think, going to be very, very strong. Now, the S&P, I am projecting it is likely to come down again, S&P. That low is 2178, we're going to call it. But I think the zone for me... That would be minimal zone, 3154. But then I got this down in here, and then something can come as far down as there. So I am going to end it there because we need to do the changeover. I'm sorry that I, I always never end up with enough time to explain everything that I want. But I took two slots this time. So I will continue and repeat, uh, hopefully, and get a little bit more out tomorrow.